Hi, I'm Greg McDaniel, lead teaching pastor here at Grace Covenant Church. And we're excited about this opportunity we have to share the glorious gospel of Christ with you today. We pray this sermon's a blessing to you, but I also wanna remind you what it tells us in Hebrews. It says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the habit of some is, but we're to encourage one another to love and good works. The way we do this is by physically coming together, uniting together and building each other up. And so whether you are a member here at Grace Covenant or just listening online, I wanna remind you that this is just a supplement to your Christian walk and in no way is meant to replace the local church or the pastors that God has brought into your life. Now let's get started here. It's, it's uh, exciting as we go through this series. And uh, Have Mercy happens to be the title today. So that's what we say, have mercy on us as we're trying to, to make everything better around here which it's uh, getting there. It's very exciting. But, uh, you know, as we look at this one about have mercy, um, <laughs> mercy and grace, by the way, are used interchangeably a lot, but they're not really the same thing. I just want to kind of start with saying there's a difference there. Uh, mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is actually getting what you don't deserve. It's when God bestows his riches upon us in Christ Jesus. We, we don't deserve that, that, but that's grace. And so actually mercy is, is, is not getting what we deserve, and God actually having a, a, a compassion upon us, but it moves him to grace, which actually moves our sin away by his provision in Christ that he bestows upon us richly. Now, as we look at that idea then of mercy, mercy is not getting what we deserve, right? It, it, there's a, there was a guy getting his portrait painted by a lady in New York, uh, Central Park, and, and uh, he was kind of a finicky, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, customer. And when she got finished with the painting, he looked at it and he said, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not right. That's not right. This is not right. Nope, 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 nope. This does not do me justice at all. And she said, sir, you don't need justice. What you need is mercy. <laughs> and so that's the idea, right, of, of, of mercy, to um, show grace and, and patience and forbearance and, and so forth, not giving people what they really deserve. And as we look at the Beatitudes, they, they break up into two groups. I want to just kind of, by way of review, bring us up to this, this fifth Beatitude this week. The first two, uh, the, the two groups are, the, the, the first group is our response to God. The first group that we saw is our response to God, the first four. And it's basically a broken spirit. When we see God in his holiness, our response is, hey, I'm broken in spirit. I'm poor in spirit. I'm bankrupt spiritually. I'm not holy. And then our Next response is, I mourn my sin. I grieve because of my sin before a holy God. I am meek before that holy God, and I hunger and thirst for his righteousness. But then, today, we begin the next section, these last three we're going to be looking at, and they deal with our response to those around us, how we respond to our fellow human beings. And today, we're beginning with the one showing mercy, the idea of showing mercy to those around us. So let's look at that one in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 7, which says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Father, we need your grace. We need your Holy Spirit to come now. Uh, without your Holy Spirit, this outline is just a skeleton. Uh, without your Holy Spirit, it's just words babbling. So Father, we need your Holy Spirit to give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the hearts to obey your word. Uh, we want to see Christ high and lifted up. We pray that you will just cause our hearts to be drawn to you, bring our, our thoughts captive, let our affections be drawn to Christ now, and let us be honest about who we are and who you are, and then obey your commands by your grace. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, Blessed are the merciful. That adjective used there for the merciful is one that entails the idea of not a one or, or two-time mercy act. I mean, sometimes we, every now and then, we have, uh, you know, get sad about something. And we may do something good once in a while for somebody else. But it's the idea of habitual lifestyle of mercy and, and a habitual lifestyle of mercy, where this is our default mode as human beings. Remember, again, the Beatitudes and the whole Sermon on the Mount is not about this moralistic rule book that if we keep it, we're going to earn God's favor. The idea is Jesus is saying, no, you're already my person. You're already my kingdom children. You're already born again and filled with the Spirit of God. This is 
how you act as a child of God. Because I am in you and you are in me, this is how you behave. You show mercy. So it's, 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 it's the, the default. It's, it's the way we live. It's the first reaction, not the second or last or random rare reaction. And Leon Morris puts it this way. There are people who show by their habitual merciful deeds that they have responded to God's love and are living by his grace. They will receive mercy on the last day. Once again, a reminder, this idea is that receiving mercy is not a reward for showing mercy, okay? It's, a, it, it's the, the consequence of being a person born again by the grace of God. Because I'm God's child, I will receive and have received mercy. Because I'm a, I'm a child of God, I will show mercy. It's an attribute. It's an earmark of the child of God. So the Beatitudes really, again, are evidences of the grace of God working out in us as his people, his kingdom people, living counterculturally in the world that we are living, okay? So there, there's, there's what we, we are challenged to do. Now, again, if we see and understand that it's not moralism that we're talking about in the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, it's not this moral therapeutic deism that's all around us where, again, as we have said, I feel good about doing good things, so I'll go to church, that makes me feel good. Oh, I'll go feed the hungry once in a while. I'll, I'll give some clothes to the, the people who need clothes once in a while, and that, therefore I now meet that, that need of feeling good. That's not what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, okay? I think I've, I've, I've pushed that enough, but, but we need to get that. What it is, is it's a lifestyle of those who have been born again. We're not doing this to earn favor with God. We're doing these things. We're living this way because we have already found favor with God in Christ Jesus. Okay? So having said that, what is mercy? All right? Well, it's imitating our Father. That's, that, that's what the Beatitudes are talking about. If you're my kingdom children, Here's what you should live like. You should live like your father. You should act like your father. You should imitate your father in heaven. And all through the scriptures, we see God revealed with these attributes. And we are never more like God than when we show mercy. Not when we go to church. That's not it. We're not, we're not showing anything big there. We're not showing that we're a great believer in God by, by having a bunch of knowledge, head knowledge and theological knowledge. No, it's when we show mercy like he showed mercy. Okay, now, having said that, let's look at these. Deuteronomy 4.31. Let's go to a place where you're not normally going to see much about mercy, supposedly. Most people say about the Old Testament, well, that's the mean God. That's the angry God. That's the God who kills people and wipes out entire civilizations, and he's terrible. We want the God of the New Testament, the baby Jesus. Sweet, nice, loving, forgiving baby Jesus. We don't want the Old Testament God of wrath and fire and plagues. And yet the whole Bible reveals the same God. There's only one God. And the Bible reveals that one God, the same throughout. And here's a verse, Deuteronomy 4.31. Look what it says. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He's merciful. Deuteronomy. If you, if you look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 18, this is a beautiful scripture that reminds us of the, the attribute of God. He is merciful. Verse 18. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. Now look at this. The city is called by name, by your name, and the, and the city that is called by your name. So they're crying out. Their city's in desolation. They're broken. And they're crying out to God, hear us, O God. Now look how they do this, verse, or the rest of the verse. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. We're not asking you to bless us and to show favor to us and to give us grace because of our righteousness. No, look at the end. We're asking you to do this because of your great mercy. The reason that we get anything from God is not because of our righteousness. It's because of his great mercy towards us. And they recognize this. Ephesians reveals this merciful God. Ephesians 2.4, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. God has loved us with a great love, no question. But why has he loved us with a great love? Well, because we're so lovable, obviously. <laughs> right, wrong, wrong. God loves us with a great love because he's so merciful. 
It's amazing. So again, this mercy of our Father is exactly what we are to emulate as His children, just as uh, human beings, right? Our children, for good or for worse, or for bad, good or bad, imitate us, or they have attributes like us, right? There's something that can be recognized of your children looking like you as a parent. And this is no different in the Christian spiritual life. We are children of God. Therefore, some of his attributes had better be shining through where people say, that's not right. That's not normal. You're acting like your father in heaven. That's, that's, the, that's the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to say, while we're here in this world, we should be showing attributes of our father in heaven, not of this earthly world. Or as Jesus said, of our earthly father, the devil. Now, again, this brings us up to a point of teaching about this, and I'm going to throw this out that makes probably some people mad, but I have to do it, and that is that we're not all God's children. I mean, you hear this very common. We've all kind of grown up. We're all God's children. We're all God's children. We're all God's creation. We're all God's creation. God has made every one of us in his image, and everybody, therefore, has dignity. Life has dignity and sanctity because all humans are made, created in the image of God. They are his creatures. They're his image bearers in that. But because of sin, we are not all born as God's children. Jesus, when he addressed the Pharisees, he said, you guys are of your father, the devil. This is why he told the rich young ruler in John 3, you must be born again because the family you're in now is not good. You need a new father. You need to be born again into a new family. That's what salvation is in Christ. That's what it means to be born again, regenerated, saved, to be called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. So those who rest in the gospel and are regenerated and reborn into the family of God, and what's the other word the Bible uses? Adopted. All those are for a reason. We cannot expect to be born in this world and say, all right, I'm already going to heaven. I'm God's child. No, this is why we preach a gospel. If we're all already God's child and children, we don't have to worry about anything. But the reason Jesus came to the earth and, and had to come on a rescue mission to bring people back to God was because we're not his children because of sin and the fall. So at any rate, that's what the Sermon on the Mount is, a, is, is, is revealing, that we are God's children, if we are, that is, if you're a child of God, Here's how you will imitate your father. You will show grace. You will show mercy. Now, Luke, finally, one more verse to look at. Luke 6, 35 through 36 says this. And this is showing the countercultural craziness of this sermon on the mount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. Now, look, this is amazing, the idea of loving your enemies. It's good to love people that are like us, right? Sure, and friends, whatever. But love your enemies. Show, show patience to those who are your enemy. He goes on and says this, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So this is explaining God. We're sons of the Most High. What is God like? He shows grace and mercy to ungrateful people and evil people. So look at the last part. Verse 36, be merciful even as your father is merciful. So there, there it is. I mean, this is, this is the challenge for us today. We claim to be Christians. We want to know, how can I live my Christian life? What is God's will for my life? How can I make this big stamp in this world that I'm a Christian, I'm going to glorify God? And, and we got all these big ideas of great grandeur and work. But yet the Sermon on the Mount reveals that the beginning place for any child of God to begin to glorify God and to represent him is to show mercy as he has shown us mercy. Man, and it's not easy. Man, this is hard stuff. To literally realize we have problems with people, we have been in very cynical attitudes, we're judgmental most of the time. Our knee-jerk reactions, our defaults, when we see other people do dumb stuff and make stupid choices and, and even hurt us, our default is to judge them, to get vengeance on them, to be angry, to put them down. I mean, that's, just, that's, just, that's, the, that's our knee-jerk reaction, right? What the Sermon on the Mount is saying and the Beatitude is saying, though, our default should be to have mercy first. Now, we're going we're gonna to build this up a little bit. We're not saying that we excuse all dumb decisions. We're not saying that we say, all right, no problem. You, you hurt me like that. No, no, no accountability. We're not saying that. We're simply saying the beginning reaction, though, to all 
all relationships in this world for the Christian is mercy. We approach everything from mercy first. So what does it mean to have mercy? I'm going to give another little bit of definition here. It means to feel the pain of another so deeply that we're compelled to do something about it, about the problem that we see in them. I mean, the Bible actually uses the term uh, bowels for that place of feeling, okay, that emotion. Um, you, if you grew up with the King James Version, you've heard of that bowels of mercy, right? Always wondered about that growing up. Bowels of mercy, right? But at any rate, it's the idea, the Greek, their, their place of emotions, their center of emotions was the intestines. It literally was the, the bowels. And, and so think about it. It makes sense. When you see something or you get some news that is so heartbreaking, have you ever got sick to your stomach? I mean, you see something that's so tragic or you've been taken off guard by some news and, and right away you just feel it in your gut. That makes sense. And therefore, the, the, the emotions or that, that, that compassion that we feel in our stomach, that's, that's the idea of mercy, being merciful to other people. William Barclay says it like this. He defines mercy this way. To get inside someone's skin until we can see things with their eyes, think things with their mind, and feel things with their feelings. That's the idea of true, genuine mercy. Bill Clinton got this right during the election, if you remember, when he famously at that moment, with the, the cameras on him close up and his lip began to quiver, and he said, I feel your pain. That's real, though. And that was genuine. And what I'm saying is, folks, that's mercy. That's what it means. I feel your pain. And, and this is what Barclay's saying. We've got to be able to climb into somebody else's life and through their eyes see what they're going through. So what does mercy say? Mercy is Paul looking at somebody who is broken. They yep, may be suffering the consequences of bad choices. Yep, it happens. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. And yet when he first sees them, his reaction is not first of all to say, ah, serves him right. <laughs> you ever said that? Come on. <laughs> See some dumb thing going on, right? That uh, serves him right. Should have been jumping off that roof in, in the first place. Shouldn't have been on that rope swing with no water in the lake anyway. I mean, whatever. And yet when Paul sees something like that, not quite like that, but when he sees somebody hurt or broken out of a bad choice, you know what his response is? There, but by the grace of God, go I. That's mercy. Because what he's saying is, I know who I am. I don't deserve anything. And I, I would be right there if it weren't for God's grace. So I will, I will respond first and foremost with mercy, with feeling first and foremost the pain or the, the struggle that's happening. John Stott puts it like this. I like this. To be meek is to acknowledge to others that we are sinners. And we've already covered that in the first uh, four Beatitudes. To be meek is to say to God, I am a sinner, and to admit to others, I am a sinner. So that's meekness. But look at this. To be merciful is to have... Com I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. To be merciful is to have compassion on others because they are sinners. So you see the difference? Meekness is admitting I'm a sinner. Co mercy is having compassion on others because I admit they're sinners. I understand we're all the same, Right? There but by God's grace, go I. So, whew, we're to show mercy. It's not always easy, right? It doesn't always happen automatically. Are any of you married? <laughs> right? I mean, this idea of, of keeping tallies, right? Uh, of keep, keeping records of wrongs, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, I washed the dishes. Yeah. Once in 10 years, are you kidding? What, are you a superhero now? I mean, right? There's conversations like that that happen. I wouldn't know about that, but, you know. So humanly speaking, our reactions are not very merciful. Again, that's the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount. It's counterculture. It's not natural. It's, again, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life as a kingdom person. Okay? And we should start seeing this in our lives if we are believers in Christ. So I'm going to show us just very quickly here, again, short sermon, but pointed for all of us. And, and we're going to see two examples in the Bible, a negative and a positive about mercy showing. The first one did not show mercy. 
So we're going to look at Matthew 18, and you can turn your Bibles, Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. We're going to be looking at something called the un unmerciful servant parable. And Jesus is talking about forgiveness and mercy here in the lives of his apostles, and he, and he answers one of their questions about forgiving others with this parable. So Matthew 18, verse 21 says this, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How often do I have to forgive this person? As many as seven times? Now, Peter's thinking he's really pious here, right? Seven times. I mean, come on. That's got to be the time, the, the, the enough, right? Good night. Seven times. I mean, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times, meet five knuckle Sally or Willie or whatever. I don't know. I'm just, you know, <laughs> whatever that means. Okay. <laughs> However, look what Jesus answers. Jesus said to him, no, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. Now, obviously, don't get into the numbers here. A lot of legalists now are writing, oh, take away seven, make it 77. Okay, 77. I'm at 20, so I can keep, I got a little ways to go, and then I'm done. He's not saying, he didn't give a number out there to say, okay, keep this number. He's saying, there is no end to your forgiveness. Just continue to show mercy. Look at the rest of the story now. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. And he's going to tell a story now about the kingdom of heaven. That's exactly what the Sermon on the Mount is about, the kingdom of heaven and how kingdom people live. So Jesus now tells a story about the kingdom of heaven and a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, what's a lot of money right there? 10,000 talents. A talent is the highest denomination of money, okay? And 10,000 is a figurative number for usually uncountable. And some commentaries would say that, because basically, folks, a talent is 20 years' salary. A talent would equal about 20 years of somebody's salary, and this guy owes 10,000 of those. That's 200,000 years worth of salary he owes somebody. So one of the commentators said that we, we would be well, instead of using hundreds of thousands or even millions but, that he owed, to say billions that this man owed. This is huge. So basically what Jesus is telling in this parable, he's setting up the idea, the contrast, that pretty much an unestimable amount of money is owed, impossible to pay back. He sets that up. And since he could not pay, verse 25, he could not pay his master, ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all he had and payment to be made. And that was common. Remember, we talked about this in Exodus. When somebody couldn't pay their debts, instead of just being directly thrown into jail, they had the option of willingly being sold into slavery to pay off their debt. That's what's happening here. This man and his whole family are going to be sold into slavery to pay off his debt. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, have mercy, that's, that's saying, and I will pay you everything. In verse 27, and out of mercy for him, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Amazing. Anybody have college loans? Student loans, right? They're forgiven. Wouldn't that be great if I could do that right? Hey, forget them, right? House payment, it's forgiven. I mean, this is like that times a billion, right? I mean, this loan, this, this debt over this man's head, no way he could repay it. Justly he should be a slave for the rest of his life, paying back the debt. And yet, out of mercy and grace, because it was the mercy that the, that, the, that the master had on the man that caused him to move to action and forgive him of the debt. So amazing. What a picture of salvation, correct? We owe God a debt that would take us all eternity burning in hell, and we never pay it back. And yet, he forgives that debt in Christ Jesus. Amazing. Amazing. We have been shown great mercy is the idea here. Now, verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him. What's a hundred denarii? About a day's salary, 10, 20 bucks maybe. 
And he seized this guy, and he began to choke him, <laughs> saying, pay what you owe me. It's the craziest thing. I can't get this movie. Years ago, I watched some movie. I don't even know what it is, but I can't get this picture out of my head when I read this. Of this little kid, he was riding his bike, and he would always, out of nowhere, come jumping on people, and he'd dive on him. He'd be strangling. He'd say, I want my $2. I want my $2. I have no idea what that is. I don't care. At any rate, it just stays in my mind. That's what this guy's doing, right? He's been forgiven an amazing amount of money that could never have been repaid, and yet he goes out and finds a guy that owes him chump change, basically, and yet he seizes the guy and demands full payment. Saying, pay me what you owe. Verse 29 goes on to say then, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have mercy with me, have patience with me, and I will pay you. Yet he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported it to their master, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And you should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. Man, this alone breaks us, I think, if we're honest. Think of your judgmentalists when you look, judgmentalism, I mean, when we look at somebody who may have wronged us or we don't like for some some sin in their life or some inadequacy, and we begin to judge, and we begin to even hate. And yet we've been forgiven so much. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Verse 35, so also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. That's huge. What about mercy in our lives? If we're children of God, if we're born-again Christians, we should be exhibiting some form of mercy. We should, we should have a default that when something is wrong, done wrong to us, we first approach it with mercy. Now, this is not saying, as I said already, that we totally overlook sin, that there's a time not to show judgment, as we saw this king did ultimately judge. Uh, it, there's, there's a time in the church where discipline takes place. There's a time in the church where we do react sternly to sin. But the first step to that is not the anger. We don't just begin any kind of a disciplinary process by saying, that's it, you're, you're done, you're out, forget it. I grew up in a very legalistic group, a very, very judgmental group of churches and pastors. And, and, and oftentimes it was said kind of about that group that, wow, those guys are the only Christian group who shoot their own wounded. And it's kind of true. I mean, it's, it'd be like, wow, man, uh, Henry, you sinned. You're done. We're done with you. That's it. It's over, man. Get out of here. We're done with you. That's it. One strike, you're out. But that's not what mercy does. It doesn't overlook the sin, but our first response to sinners is that I'm a sinner too. And I need to look at the person through their eyes, their hurt, see the situation, and have mercy first and foremost, and lovingly bring people back to a relationship with, with, with Christ. That's the idea. And then, of course, if stubbornness prevails and no repentance happens and, and and, and just basically disobedience continues to the rebelliousness and so forth, obviously there's the next step. But I love the picture in Scripture. It, the whole thing is there. You can't just take one attribute above all the others. So what we see is that justice, which is very needed, very real in Scripture, begins first with mercy, if it's godly. And this is what Jesus is showing us. So yes, first and foremost, we approach others with, with mercy because we know that we have been forgiven a ton and that by God's grace, we would be right there as well. Now, that was the wrong way. And, and this is what we're not to do, folks. We're not to have this approach. Like, man, I'm forgiven a bunch, but man, you suck over here. Many of you just judge me because I said that word. <laughs> I say have mercy. But at any rate, you get my point. That's not the way to live. We can't do that. We, that. That's how the Pharisees live. 
They look at where they're at now, and they think, well, look at us. As we're so religious, and we know so much truth, and, and we have so many letters after our name, and blah, 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 blah. And Jesus said, man, you guys are empty. You have no spiritual life. You're dead. But the true believers understand we were at the mercy of God. We were poor spiritually. We know we're bankrupt. We know we're sinners. We mourn that sin, and we understand that God... God is just in destroying us, and yet he showed mercy to us. So we will show mercy to others. And that's what Jesus does, and he's the example of what we should be. Matthew 14, 14, very, very short verse here, but it, it, it describes what mercy is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As, he, as it says there, when he went ashore, he came uh, from, from his, his boat ride to, to the shore, and he sees people in great need. It says, he saw a crowd, a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So what we learn from this is that the word compassion here basically means that Jesus' stomach churned within him. He felt that in his gut. He saw the hurt of the people. It was real to him. He just didn't just show up and say, oh, yeah, serves them right. They made bad choices. They, They get what they deserve. So be it. Hope they find their way. That's not it. He hurt for them. But look at this, folks. The other lesson we learn here is that mercy alone is useless. Mercy alone is useless. Mercy is not an end in itself. This beatitude is not just an end all. Mercy must be a catalyst to action. That's what it is. Mercy is a catalyst to action. If I just have mercy, I look at somebody and say, oh, that's pretty sad. Good night. Boy, Poor Pat, she's having a hard time, and man, I feel pretty bad about that. That is really sad, and and it's real. It's real real pain, and then I go on about my business. So mercy does her no good there. I had mercy. I felt bad. I saw it. I recognized the pain and the hurt, but mercy must be a catalyst to action. That's what we see in Christ there. His mercy drew him to action. God's mercy drove him to action because grace came and says, I will not only see the need of a broken sinner, but I will meet the need by taking the sin away completely and giving them righteousness. Mm. And and we then are to live like that. As our Father lived, we're to have mercy on other people and then move to action and show grace by giving people what they don't deserve. Remember, mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. So we deserve hell, but God doesn't give us that. Instead, he gives us the righteousness of Christ. That's grace. I don't deserve that. And so when we see people hurting, mercy says, wow, I could say to you, you deserve that. I could say to you, man, you got yourself into this problem. Then you get get yourself out. Uh, I could say you made your bed lie in it. I, I understand all those things that we could say, but mercy first says, wow, this is hurtful. This is real. This is pain. And whatever reason you're here for, I, that's not important at this point. Let's, let's help. That's what, that's what we're doing with Threads of Hope. We don't just look at people and say, well, you got a problem with clothes? Well, what do you spend your money on? Why can't you buy clothes for your kids? You got cable TV? Uh-oh. <laughs> and I understand. Ah, when you preach a message, you can't deal with every detail, folks. We're looking at mercy today. There will be a time to deal with those other issues. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we say if somebody's mishandling their money, we continue to enable. I didn't say that. Everybody say he didn't say that. I sound like a charismatic guy now, I know, but I just want to make sure you know that I didn't just say we enable people to do stuff, to continue bad behavior. But what I am saying is mercy begins first by not going there. Mercy first and foremost says any of us could be there. So how can we now at this moment begin to move in grace and meet this need, and continue to build a relationship where we make these people stronger, healthier in all areas of their life, just like God did for us. So again, folks, this this message today is just the beginning. This is just, we need mercy. We better get some of that, because if we're believers, we've been forgiven a lot. We must forgive a lot. But then we must also move into action. Micah, and we're going to end with this, Micah 6, 8, basically is a creed for all believers. Now, 
I'm going to read this. Again, we're talking about mercy. And, and really, Micah 6, 8, and 9 is a pretty good example of mercy balanced with judgment. B- because even though God is merciful, and, and God is merciful, folks, to all of his creation, as I said before. Man, the rain falls on Bill Maher's garden and Dawkins' garden. The sun shines on them. They breathe God's air every day. That's mercy. God is merciful. And he's gracious and loving. We understand all that. But there is also the judgment of God, the justice of God. And that's not annulled by mercy. Mercy's there. Thank God. (laughs) But judgment is also there. And so... Micah 6, 8 says this, and this is how we should live first and foremost. This should be our creed as believers. This is how we live in this world around us as children of God, kingdom kids. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. I got to stop there. What? This is wonderful. This verse in our postmodern culture is so needed. Look at this. He has shown you. Who's he? God, the creator of all things. He has shown you who? O mortal, mortal mortal. Not gods, little gods. We're mortals. He's God. So we see a big distinction made here in the book of Micah. It sets it up. Big God, little man, little mortals, eternal being who created you. And that God says to you mortals, what is good? Do you see this? You know what that answer is in our postmodern culture? There is a good There is a right. (laughs) There is a truth. And it is not subjective. This is so good. God has declared to mortals his truth. That means truth is objective. It's outside of us. The reason we as humans have any morality whatsoever, any kindness toward each other whatsoever, is because of the God who created us. Our forefathers knew this. The language of the Constitution at least lets us know that that we're all endowed by inalienable rights by a creator. We didn't come up with that. Society didn't somehow mandate that. It's not a human or psychological or social construct. Moralism's not, even though the arguments are out there for that. No, it's objective. And it comes from the creator. He tells us what is good or we would not know good. And look, here it is. Here it is. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To see injustices and move on those. That's part of mercy. Love mercy, act justly. They go together. And walk humbly with your God. And all of these traits we've already seen in the the, the Beatitudes, correct? Humble ourselves before God. Be meek before God. Understand that He is sovereign. Understand that we're broken. He's merciful. We should be merciful. And we should also act justly, looking at the wrongs around us, moving on those. When we see people hurt or done wrongly, we're going to intervene. We're going to help. But just to show you again the contrast, verse 9 goes on to talk about the judgment of God that falls. <laughs> so there's that balance. It's not, it's not doing away with the fact that God will ultimately judge wrong doing. It's not saying that we as Christians can't ultimately judge and say, you know what, this is handled wrong. We've helped you. We've, we've walked through this and you continue to, to make the bad choice and, and we've showed the mercy and we've showed the patience and we've showed the grace. And now in love, we must continue to move to a place of stricter discipline where maybe fellowship is cut off or you know, we, we can no longer meet together. I mean, this, this, this is what Paul talks about and that's a whole other sermon. So let me back off of that and get back on mercy. <laughs> right now we're talking about mercy. That's, a good, that's, that's the place we have to start. Let us begin showing mercy, realizing, wow, I am definitely not perfect. How can I expect my wife to be perfect? How can I expect my husband to be perfect? How can I expect my kids to be perfect? Now, that's the beginning place. That doesn't mean we don't instruct and continue to discipline. You, you understand that. But approaching each other in this way, is the, it goes a long way in, in, in being what God has called us to be as fathers and mothers brothers and sisters in church here, co-workers, whatever. Approaching everything, first of all and foremost, realizing I have been forgiven much. Therefore, I can be merciful to this person. Let's pray. Lord, may you grant us the ability 
to be merciful. May you grant us the grace to live as Christ lived. And we know that because he's in us and your spirit abides in us and your word abides in us, that we can represent you in this world for your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.